Thank you so much for having me. And uh, indeed, there are some also connecting thread between this talk and Ian's talk. Um, some of the topological data analysis is also involved, even though um, I spare people of the persistent diagram part of it. Um, but indeed, like people are in cells and uh, neurons have some um, uh, similarity. And in particular, I have been interested in the study of multi-stability, so the, the coexistence of multiple available patterns and, um, and to study them globally, how are they organized, how are they connected through uh, the transitions. So, um, okay, let me change my site. So, uh, well, I want to dedicate this talk to uh, Professor Herman Hocken, who I've just received the news, uh, who has passed away. And he's the father of synergetics. Is um, so a lot of the work I will be talking about uh, today are based on his theoretical foundation on the mathematical self organization in complex systems. So, um, what are complex systems then? So, uh, so to me, the complexity in social and biological systems come from the existence of multiple organized states and the ability to transition uh, between them. So. From the left, there's a kind of uh, visual uh, representation of what I think social systems are. It's not about individual people being static, doing the same thing all the time. It's about people coming together and synchronize more or less with different people at different times. And you can transition from different sort of particle configuration over time, much like the cell migration that you've just seen in the previous talk. And uh, in the brain is actually more or less the same. Uh, you can see this kind of dance. This is a video of the synchronization between uh, two, uh, 200 different brain regions. And uh, you can see that different brain regions, when they're red, they are more or less synchronized and uh, they're anti-synchronized with some other brain regions. But you can see this constant change in different kind of synchronization patterns between brain regions over time. So uh, what I do is trying to come up with the methods um, to actually uh, represent these different uh, coordination patterns and represent the transition between them. And this video by was stolen from Olive Sporn's uh, Twitter. And uh, so uh, this is very much a physics audience, but I still want to cover the basis of uh, a cartoonish version of what dynamical system approach to this type of problem is looking like. So. Uh, in the most simplistic way, we can think of a dynamical system as a uh, landscape. And uh, the horizontal axis here, it represents some kind of states that could be different stage of social uh, coordination. And the landscape is guiding the state of the system. So some of the states are special as, uh, for example, these valleys. And uh, if this, so I say the social coordination in the in their particular states and like two dancers moving towards each other, um, they are stable in the sense that if you perturb the system a little bit, uh, the landscape or the dynamical system will guide them uh, back towards the stable states of coordination. And um, so these are called attractors. And, um, and under certain slow changes in the system, we can see the um, certain patterns got destabilized and transition is induced towards the different patterns of coordination. So uh, most of the talk uh, of today uh, is about how do we characterize this type of multi-stable landscape with multiple available uh, patterns, coordination patterns, and how can we characterize the transitions uh, between them. And uh, the early work of mine was indeed the studying of the rhythmic coordination between people. And I will not actually talk about the details of those studies, uh, but the essence of what I've learned from those studies, once we're moving from studying multi-stability into coordinated elements and to many body problem, uh, we have, we lack the theoretical tools to really understand what those models are doing, uh, where are the attractors and how are they connected? And we're also lacking the, um, data analysis tool to really extract this information of where the tractors are uh, and trying to understand the organization globally. And eventually I turn into topological data analysis, but that's, I will go back to that at the end. But I will uh, start by talking about a more intuitive problem for a lot of people uh, who are studying this uh, multi-elements interaction is 
uh, the brain. So uh, very naturally, the brain involves many interacting neurons, interacting brain regions, and uh, it's been very extensively modeled in different ways with dynamical systems. And uh, so I will talk about how can we look at the multi-stable landscapes of brain dynamics and what can we learn from, uh, from those. And then I will talk about given if we don't know the theoretical model, we only have the data, how can we really chart this hidden theoretical landscape from the data alone uh, by more or less a topological representation? And finally, I kind of go back to the social interaction to see if the methods um, developed in uh, neuroscience can be applied to um, social interaction as well. So I will start with this brain dynamic landscape story. So uh, in case you haven't been so familiar with neurodynamics, uh, so in the earlier days, the study of neuroscience is really about let's make people do really complicated tasks and see what the brain is doing. But in the last one or two decades, people are starting to become more interested in the resting brain. When people are not doing any tasks, the brain dy dynamics is actually uh, sometimes more complicated than when you're doing a complicated task. Um, in fact, you can see that, uh, remember the earlier video that I showed you, the resting brain is constantly switching between different kind of synchronization clusters that are called resting state networks. And the switchings uh, has been found to be related to different psychiatric disorders. So the transitions and the organization are often impaired when people with psychiatric disorder. And so naturally people want to know why. So theoretically, where are these coordinated states coming from? And uh, how can we model the switch um, across the different type of states? So uh, traditionally, this type of problem has been modeled by dynam uh, using dynamical system. I'm giving you the schematic of how the research has been typically done. So you uh, first of all have the data uh, of the brain dynamics that you typically measured as the, the bold signal, the uh, blood oxygenation dependent signal measured from fMRI. Yeah, you're correlating the activity across different brain regions. And you come up with this functional connectivity matrix, pretty, pretty much just telling you uh, how similar the uh, activities are, or how synchronized any two brain regions are as this little matrix. And now you want to model essentially this matrix with some kind of neurodynamic model. And those are typically differential equations. I'm sparing you the math here, um, but they're generally uh, you're modeling the local dynamics of each region with a classical neural mass model, mean field model, and you connect these local regions through a global network. Now here, uh, the global network uh, connectivity is actually informed by the actual physical anatomical connectivity you can measure from the diffusion imaging, uh, also from MRI. So you have an anatomically informed biophysical model of brain dynamics. And you simulate those data and you come up also with this model connectivity matrix and you try to fit that to the real data. And the theory has been uh, for many years, the, uh, the resting state is really one state. So it's a particular it's equilibrium, a particular attractor where the transient change in the synchronization state is about noisy exploration near the single attractor. So in the single valley, we're bumping around and that's how you see the differences in different synchronization patterns. And uh, however, um, this has led to a mystery and I will show you as the example of this earlier study, but a lot of study have a similar flavor. The right hand side, you see a actual human uh, functional connectivity matrix. I will use a laser pointer so you can see me better. And um, so um, the left hand side, you can see a model uh, uh, functional connectivity generated from dynamical system model of the same person's brain. And uh, you will obviously notice there is a lack of the anti-diagonal symmetry in the model that is uh, very um, obvious in the human functional connectivity. So in fact, what you're seeing, this uh, the lack of symmetry here uh, is because the model really cannot capture the similarity between the intra-hemisphere connectivity, so the connection within the same hemisphere and the intra-hemisphere intra connectivity. So if the this two brain regions are similar, then they're kind of connecting to the same region in the same side in a very similar way. And the symmetry is really lost in uh, this type of model. So why? So uh, 
people has hypothesized that the uh, this is because the inner hemisphere anatomical connectivity cannot be accurately retrieved. Uh, so there's under constant underestimate of the anatomical connection across the hemisphere. So we can simply uh, just not consider them. So we ignore the any functional connectivity across the hemisphere. But what I will show you that if you can move on from the idea that the resting state is really one attractor, uh, then you will see a slightly different story of what's happening. So uh, here's, uh, I'm gonna give you a cartoon version how, how can we connect the global feature of the multi-stable dynamic landscape to the idea of synchronization? So we're talking about the feature of the overall layout of different attractors or valley in this landscape, instead of just the shape of this particular valley here. And uh, for example, uh, more obviously, the, uh, the landscape really determines what type of attractors are available. This also determines what type of transitions are possible. So let's say if the, the landscape looks like this, you uh, the, track, the brain can only move, the left and right hemisphere can only move up and down together. So there are only the synchronized states available. So whenever you move around this to a tracker, the left and right hemisphere will always be uh, synchronized. If your landscape looks like below, uh, you only have the two attractors where the left and right hemisphere are independently activated. Though when the brain is moving around this landscape, the, uh, the left and right hemisphere will more or less be anti-correlated. So you can associate really the location of different attractors uh, within this global landscape to the levels of synchronization when the brain is moving across attractors. And uh, I will skip over the detailed calculation, just tell you the results. So if you actually compute a correlation between brain region while they move across attractors, you will suddenly have this uh, anti-diagonal symmetry restored. So you can fully capture the similarity between interhemisphere and uh, interhemisphere connectivity. And uh, if we also follow a traditional path of trying to find the best attractor that represent the resting state, we will uh, still have this uh, lack of uh, interhemisphere connectivity issue. So in fact, the single attractor model on the right-hand side uh, captured very well the human structural connectivity itself, uh, whereas the um, cross attractor model better capture the functional connectivity. So in essence, the, the, is the movement across these attractors better capture the nonlinear dependency of the function on the structure? All right, now we're moving on to the scenario where we often find ourselves in is that we don't have a priori model which will allow us to compute where the tractors are in the system. And this is especially the case in any real world scenario. And uh, so what I wanted to do is to try to find a theoretically validated way to be able to retrieve these attractors uh, from the data alone. Uh, of course, there are a millions of uh, state detection and transition detection algorithm out there. You can find them. Uh, so here, what I really want is to have a data analysis method that respects the dynamical system theory of the brain. So I already talked to you a little bit about that we can have this differential equation represented by this picture here that captures what we think how, how the brain is working mathematically. And we can compute some kind of landscape and figure out where the attractors are. Uh, but this doesn't give us data. So, but we can do the traditional way of simulating uh, the activity of the brain as well using the same model. But here I'm changing some of the parameters in the model such that I can very finely control where the transitions will happen. So I have a controlled way of generating the transitions between attractors. And what I want is if given this um, time series alone, I want to be able to have a reduced representation of this hidden dynamic landscape, theoretical landscape, where the nodes are the attractors in this landscape and the edges represent an actual transition that occurs uh, in the data. So I have a graph, I want a graph representation of the dynamics landscape. Um, and I will skip over the data, actually uh, topological data analysis part, I will just tell you 
A method has been developed uh, that's called the temporal mapper. It is built on a earlier work on uh, in topological data analysis called mapper, um, but uh, adapted towards well, to be more aligned with dynamical system. And, um, and we can reconstruct reasonably well the theoretical ground truth transition network from just the simulated data alone without knowing the actual math. And, uh, and then more interestingly, this is more like a validation step and uh, you want to apply also um, the, the methods to the real uh, human data. So here I'm showing you the results. Um, two transition networks computed from human fMRI data, uh, so neural imaging data, where they're doing a bunch of uh, different tasks. So uh, they are switching between different tasks um, uh, intermediately. And so those tasks could be um, uh, working memory tasks and uh, or they're tracking a video, tracking a fish across the screen, or they could be doing some math, or they could be just resting. So, um, so the color of these graphs are showing you when the subject is doing a particular task, where their brain is in this hidden landscape, essentially. So now I want to ask you, uh, I will tell you these uh, two subjects perform very differently uh, in their working memory and math tasks. And so, could you guess that uh, which uh, subjects has done better? Participation. You can see arguments yeah. either way. The one yeah. on the uh, Ashok, can you say that again? The one on the left. Is doing better or worse? Better. That is actually correct. So, uh, yay! And uh, so the, the one on the left is doing better. So in general, statistically, the participant who has, when they're doing the cognitive demanding tasks like working memory and math, uh, the dynamics is much more constricted to the, the center of the graph. Uh, whereas people who are performing worse, their brain is generally more diffuse across all the different places, no matter what the task is. And, um, so the, really the mapping between the behavioral tasks that people are doing to the underlying brain dynamic landscape uh, can tell you a lot about um, people's performance. And um, I still have some time. And uh, so now I have the time to also uh, show you that uh, if this type of idea of tracking attractors and transitions using topological data analysis can also be applied to real world social interaction where you really cannot come up with a model, for example, for a psychotherapy session. And um, so why psychotherapy? So uh, first of all, is one of the most accept effective treatment for, uh, for psychiatric disorders. And among many different types of uh, psychotherapy methods, and there is a shared active ingredient, which is a therapeutic alliance, is whether the, there is a mutual uh, connection essentially between the therapist and, and uh, the patient. Um, but uh, the alliance is really itself a dynamic process. So um, there are sometimes rupture in the, in the dynamics, which is not necessarily bad because you also need some kind of changes to move the conversation uh, forward. Uh, but generally there are two types of ruptures in the therapeutic alliance. One is confrontation, so people are fighting, and uh, or it could be also a withdrawal rupture when uh, both parties essentially talking about things are not essential for the therapy. And uh, so my collaborator, Xiao Chen Luo, uh, used to also be from Michigan State University, and now she's at Santa Clara University as assistant professor. So she wanted to study uh, if we can infer from the interpersonal dynamics of warmth and dominance of the patient and therapist um, to, to tell us about when a withdrawal rupture or confrontation rupture happens. To, on the top, you can see this is moment to moment encoded dynamics of interpersonal relations. And, uh, and the lower part is the aspirated um, rupture level. And uh, it turns out um, that the, on average, if you average the data across the session, there is not a consistent differentiation between the two types of ruptures in light of interpersonal dynamics. So you cannot consistently know from the warmth and dominance of what type of rupture is more dominant in this session. 
So, uh, which is a little bit surprising. So she wanted to know, uh, can we really look at the moment to moment transitions uh, between these interpersonal states and to infer something from uh, the uh, temporal information? So uh, we apply a temporal mapper again that you've seen previously that we apply to brain dynamics. And now we are applying the same methods to understanding the interpersonal dynamics of warmth and, um, and dominance. So the left and right graphs you're seeing are constructed from the warmth and dominance dynamics. Uh, so they're exactly the same, but the color is based on the levels of rupture, uh, alliance rupture at a moment. So the left graph is colored by the levels of confrontation, average confrontation rupture. And the right-hand side, you're seeing the levels of withdrawal rupture. So they're already visually different. And I will tell you that statistically, the confrontation rupture are much more concentrated in large nodes or large attractors in the graph, while the withdrawal rupture is kind of don't care. They're mindering around. They're not really a particular attractive state. And uh, more, uh, interesting finding has come out uh, and we're preparing a manuscript for this and then say stay tuned for more. So I will not um, talk too much about uh, the other unpublished results here. And uh, so I want to summarize. Uh, I have showed you that, uh, first of all, we can approach a social dynamics and neurodynamics theoretically. Um, based on understanding of the landscape of the theoretical model. So where are the tractors and how are transitions uh, organized in this landscape? And um, I have also shown you if we don't know the theoretical model and uh, how can we try to retrieve some kind of representation of this hidden landscape from data alone uh, using topological data analysis in particular here using a graph representation of the landscape. And so this is more of a data science uh, approach to the problem and ongoing work and future work is really trying to uh, continue to connect the theoretical modeling aspects to the data science. So the data analysis does not drift too much away from an actual dynamical system model of the system. And uh, uh, very importantly to more quantitatively directly connect the landscape from the social scale to the neural level. And uh, hopefully we'll soon get a grant from NIH. And um, so, uh, and then really accomplish the, the ambition of connecting um, different type of systems uh, in biological social system across scales. So with that, I want to uh, uh, thank my collaborators. Um, these are years of work with different uh, uh, excellent scientists from Florida Atlantic University, Stanford and Michigan State and um, mainly funded by the National Institute of Mental Health. And then I thank you for your attention.